Um, so my name is Liam. Uh, I'm originally from a town called Menlo Park. Uh, that's where Facebook is. That's all I can really tell you about it. It wasn't there when I was there. Uh, it, was, it, it was a company called Sun Microsystems. Um, any Sun Microsystems fans? No? Okay. Um, uh, so I grew up in the Silicon Valley. Uh, I studied uh, mathematics and Latin. Uh, uh, and uh, I moved to Paris in 2010. Uh, I got my first job working uh, at a startup because I said I was from Menlo Park and um, the person hired me. That was it. Um, and I ended up uh, really liking what was going on in the Paris startup scene uh, back in 2011, uh, a while ago. And I started, uh, I started this blog called The Rude Baguette um, where I just started uh, writing about companies and people that I thought were interesting. Uh, I wrote about e-founders a couple of times, sometimes good things, sometimes less good things. Um, and uh, uh, I, I ended up just telling a lot of other people's stories. Uh, I'm, I love meeting interesting people. Uh, it, it, if I was alive 300 years ago, I probably would have been crafting papyrus or whatever about mathematicians. But in this era, the, the most interesting people that I have seen are, are building companies, because that's the easiest way to take uh, something that doesn't exist and, and make it exist. Um, so, uh, so that's what I do, uh, and, 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 and we'll talk a little bit more about how that went and, and, and what I did, but uh, that's a bit of my background. Uh, I love telling stories, and uh, so part of tonight will be a bit of a story, and part of it will be, most of it will try to be helpful advice. Uh, and without uh, further ado, how about we get started? Does that sound good? Yeah. Cool. Um, so that's me. Um, uh, I'm really happy on that day. My company bankrupted three months after that photo. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see it in my face, but I knew it. Uh, um, so my name is Liam. I'm originally from California, a uh, self-identified emigrant uh, living in Paris. Um, I'm currently head of brand strategy at Mad Kudu, uh, which is a predictive lead scoring solution uh, founded by some really, really smart French people who built a really, really good product. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what Mad Crew does later in the context of the talk. Uh, and as I said, uh, I used to run a blog called The Rude Baguette. How many people have heard of The Rude Baguette? Maybe read The Rude Baguette? If you haven't, don't worry about it. It's irrelevant today. I don't run it. It's not me. <laughs> um, but uh, it was super duper fun back in the day. Um, so, uh, l l let's jump in. Um, why are we here? So, uh, I, I told you before I like telling other people's stories. Um, I, I like creating an emotional connection with people. And, and, and when I bankrupted that company, when, when I looked back on what really worked and what didn't work, I realized one, media industry, not great at making money. Uh, but more importantly, what worked really well was building a brand. Uh, I accidentally built a brand that meant that I could walk into any room and a good 80% of people would look at me and know who I was. And, I, and I'm terrible with faces and names, so it was a, it was a very tough time. Um, but, but what I learned about brand is it is so much more powerful than anything you can rationally build or sell or pitch. It's, it, it is the reason you're using Slack. I promise you. The only reason you're using Slack is because it's Slack. Otherwise, you'd be using HipChat. It's the same freaking product and it existed five years before it. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the reason Spotify is Spotify and not Deezer is, is brand. Um, and going to the U.S. market, um, that's a different conversation. Um, but uh, the, so, so what we're talking about today is, is not rationality. We're talking about emotions. Uh, we're talking about an irrational, people making decisions despite reason, right? Okay. So, so what that means is, I just really like this GIF every time. <laughs> it's so great, sorry. Um, <laughs> What this means is we're not talking about logos and, 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 and serif fonts versus sans serif fonts. We're not talking about taglines and whether you should, how many words it should be. And, and we're not talking about Alan's latest billboard campaign in, in the Metro, which hmm, I would have done it differently. But that's neither here nor there. I'm, I don't work at that company. Uh, what we're talking about uh, is brand. And those things are how you bring your brand to the, to the people. And, and what you decide to bring to the people is, is, uh, is, is fundamentally the decisions that you want to make when you're building a brand. 
You want to figure out who, who am I, how do I want people to think about me, how do they think about me today, and how do I close that gap there. Uh, um, so that, that's, what, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, I worked at a company called Algolia for 18 months. Uh, how many people have heard of Algolia? I don't have to pitch them. They're pretty well known in Paris. Good. Um, so uh, Algolia succeeded because they were authentic. They succeeded because everything they did lined up with everything they said, which lined up with everything they sold. And that's a really powerful combo. It's really hard to preach making someone's life better and being on the side of developers and then charging people money. It's a very tough uh, uh, balance to find. And every brand you know does it every single day, uh, which is amazing. Um, and, and so authenticity is so important. Uh, it's, it's a thousand times more important when you're selling to developers because uh, they see right through all of your marketing BS. Um, but if you can sell to developers, you can sell to anyone. I guarantee you that. And, and if you sell like you're selling to developers uh, and, you, and you bring that level of authenticity, then you can sell to anyone. Um, the, other, the other thing that uh, Algolia did really well and, and that brands do really well is consistency. Uh, it's not a question of running a brand awareness campaign. Everything is a brand awareness campaign. What I say about Algolia now is as much a reflection of their brand as what their website said the day I joined. It's the same thing. It's just how they bring the brand of the people. Former employees, current employees, customers, uh, investors, neighbors of the founders, everything. And, and the fact that every person who ever interacts with a great brand walks away with the same impression is not a mistake. It is a very intentional effort and, and a very process-built system. Um, also, I love jumping on trampolines. Um, so, um, don't actually take notes. Um, so, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I think about uh, brands. I got like way too many slides and I, can, I feel like I'm already going slow, so I'm, I might speed it up. Um, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you don't understand me. Um, so uh, the first thing you want to think about is uh, your brand is not something you wrap around your startup. Your startup is something you wrap around a brand. And the sooner you figure that out, the sooner you're going to start building an, a, a brand that's scalable and grows. And it's really easy to think about because your, your, your startup is what? It's three things. It's a product, it's a company, and it's a business, right? That, that is... Uh, what functionally a, a startup comes down to. And if you build your brand around those things, as opposed to building those three things around your brand, then as your product expands, it's going to what? It's going to rub up against your brand, right? How can your brand take space if your product expands? What happens if you want to build a new feature, go after a new market, change the sector you're in? Well, if your brand was built around the sector you were going after, then all of a sudden you have inc inconsistency, right? However, if you build your product around your brand, then whatever your product does, if you pivot, if all of a sudden you go from selling computers to selling MP3 players to building the largest uh, file sharing service on the planet to whatever, to selling luxury watches, all of that makes sense if, you're, if, it's, if it is just evidence of your brand. It doesn't make sense if your brand is evidence of your product. Right? And so that's the, that's the first thing to think about, is everything you're going to do is going to be a function. Whether, you, whether you're thinking about it or not, that is how it's going to play out. Um, so let's think about what those three things are when we think about these, these, these distinct elements. And, and I, I call this the holy trinity of branding because I was raised with Roman Catholic guilt, and I can't get that out of my head. And we've got this idea of three things that are one thing. Don't worry about the math. It lines up well for the metaphor. Um, so, uh, when you think about your company, uh, I, I, I think about the founder vision. Really just the founders are a really good idea to embody that company. It's the, the company culture. It's the, the manifesto. It's, it's that, that intangible true north uh, in the company. Uh, uh, when you think about the business, you're thinking about growth. Um, today, one of our slides in our, in our all hands just said the words, the number 70, because we hit a milestone. It's, it's metrics. Those are the things you want to see. It's, 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 it's up and to the right, right? That's the, that's the business uh, 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 brand. And how you talk about that 
how Buffer talks about it is different than how Hootsuite talks about it, and that is as much an indicator of the difference between the brands of those companies as anything else. Um, it's also expansion. It's, I, I, it's world domination. Uh, there, there, you don't always have to invent something new. For the most part, people's goal is world domination, and that tends to be your business brand. Uh, and the last one is your product. It's, it's how you think about your users. It's how you think about the impact your product has on your users. It's how you, it's how you build new features, right? It's, it's everything tangible, and I use the word tangible lightly because we're all building software products, I presume, so it's intangible unless you go to this data center. Uh, but it's the tangible aspect of your brand. I can touch it, I can click it, I can swipe it, it has bugs. Um, uh, it does. Um, so let, let's, let's bring it in maybe a little more concrete and let's talk about uh, one company, Algolia. Um, so uh, when you look at that company brand you, and you talk about company culture, we talk about grit and candor and care and trust and humility. I've said these five words a thousand times in the last two years because it is so ingrained. It's on the walls of the office. It's on your onboarding. It's, on, it's, in, it's in the way we recruit people. There, there are questions associated to these values. There are Slack emoji reactions. There are dedicated channels. I, did I? No. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have had that beer before I got on here. Um, it's, it, they're, they're strong, right? And then, and then you jump over to the business brand. Uh, if you've ever talked to anyone in Algolia, they will tell you 100% year over year growth. It's not a plan, it's a fact. And it remains a fact every single year. They're surprisingly good at doing that. Uh, if you look at product brand, we jump to something completely different. It's the best developer experience. It's making something that used to be available to a small amount of highly specialized people available to everyone. Right? Those are three very distinct ideas, right? Insane growth, uh, uh, democratization of technology, uh, uh, humility, right? And then you realize that those things are the same thing. Those things play together. It is, it is, it, it is uh, uh, the, the grit uh, uh, of, wanting to, of wanting to grow quickly so that they can bring this product to everyone. They are constantly thinking about who has a terrible search experience and how do we fix that? Because it sucks. Because anyone who's ever been in the metro on Spotify trying to find an artist and you don't have 4G, but you're not in offline mode, you're in edge, so you can't even find your own artists that are downloaded on your phone, you, you hate it. I viscerally hate it if it wasn't obvious. It's why I live on the line one. Best 4G, <laughs> best 4G of all of the lines. Just live on the line one, give up on everything else. They're close to the surface. Um, and, and you think about that, those things line up. They can talk about all three of those topics without ever being inconsistent, right? We look at Airbnb, right, as a product. They have this beautiful vision, belong everywhere. You are home wherever you go, which is amazing. I've, I've been doing Airbnb for eight years before that I did couch surfing. I, I, I hate hotels as a because it just doesn't feel like I'm home, it feels like I'm in a box. And Airbnb captured that in, in, in the product, in the language, in how you discover stuff, in, in how they tell you that you're ready, and how they invite you, right? Uh, and at the same time, right, we're talking about 300 million check-ins in 10 years, uh, and, and in their company, in the way they describe their company values, we're talking about be a host, not just be a host on the platform, be a host to someone else, right? and you see that they bring these three things together. They, they line up well. And that's what creates Airbnb's strong brand. The employees have the exact same experience as the customers, have the exact same experience as the hosts. Um, I did this slide a couple months ago. Uh, I, I wrote the original version of it, but only um, this past month, Airbnb made a huge announcement. Did anyone catch this? Anyone paying attention to Airbnb news? They announced they want to give equity to uh, in shares to their uh, hosts, right? That's a that's a huge move, and it and it lines up perfectly with with everything that they do. It lines up with their product brand. It lines up with their company brand. It lines up with their business brand, and that's where you see that every time these companies make a move, they're not making a move to build a brand. The move is proof of the brand, right? They can do that. And, it's, and, and even if it's out of left field, they can do it because it lines up with the story they're trying to tell, with the image they're trying to build. 
Airbnb is belonging everywhere. And that's super cool. Um, so let's come back to a, to a smaller company. Let's come back to Mad Kudu and let's see what Paul says about this slide. Um, so uh, when we started, the first thing I did day one, I walked into Mad Kudu is I sent everyone a super duper long Google survey and we, and we started talking about who our brand was. And the best place to start whenever you walk into a new company, whenever you start working on this, is ask the employees. And, and it's amazing what, what consistently came back and it's amazing what didn't consistently come back and you almost could have forecasted the last six months of what we focused on based on based on just looking at who was completely on sync about things and where was there not necessarily disagreement but divergence in priority and that's and, and therefore inconsistency right uh and so when we look at that we talk about right we talk about persisting and growing is something that universally came back when when i reached out and talked to the first 10 Mad Kudu employees was people feel like Mad Kudu is a place where you can develop yourself personally. It's, it's okay to go for a run. It's okay to take the day off to go on a hike. Paul runs like 800 miles every single weekend and I, I can't even do the math on it. Um, he, he ran a marathon. Did you run a marathon since you got, got here? No. Not yet? Okay. It'll happen. He ran. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, see, I'll see tomorrow morning on our, on our stand up. Um, and at the same time, from a business brand, we saw a lot of things starting to kick into play. Relevance at scale. Everyone picked up on that. Relevance at scale. How do you create a relevant experience for everyone, everywhere, at every single moment, right? And then on the product side, talking about actionable intelligence, talking about intelligent action. And, 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 and our goal becomes, how do we take these seemingly disparate things and bring them together? How do we find the consistency? How do we find the cohesion? And I can't tell you that we've done the work or that, or that we've convinced the masses yet, but this is where you start. You start by looking at what are we? How do we see ourselves? And the next step is you go and you talk to other people and you go, who are we? Tell me, tell me who I am. And then you look at the gap and you go, which of, that, uh, which of them is right? and which of them is wrong. Either we're right and we're doing a bad job at communicating it, or they're right and maybe we should be a little flexible on how we see ourselves. Uh, and, and, and that development process is, is a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so now you can get ready to take notes. Um, uh, nice, it's still a gift. Oh, love that movie. Um, okay, um, so, uh, so these, these are the three lines that I talk about. This is the, fourth time I've talked about this today. Um, so you take three lines on a line graph. How do you see you? How does your audience see you? How do, how do the masses, the people see you? And how do you express yourself, right? We, we know what we really want to do is, is we want to create cohesion. But what you might not know is those lines should be exactly the same. They shouldn't be apart. How you speak about yourself should line up exactly with how you see yourself, should line up exactly with how people see you. And when we talk about authentic, consistent branding, that's what we're looking at. The language that we use is both true to ourselves and also perfectly communicates what we want to get across to the people we're talking to. The, a really good litmus test for that is how do other people talk about you and how good at that are, are they at pitching what you do to other people? That's, that's where you can start to see the gap. Um, there are really tactical brand questions that you can ask yourself. Uh, these are some of the first questions that I ask when I meet any company. Uh, when people start talking about, we want to innovate on top of this industry. We think the knowledge management industry is broken and we want to completely fix it. And there's really easy questions. The, the easiest one, you can ask it every day, do you want to be number one or number two? It's an easy one. If you're number one, you are going to create the industry. Why are you going to create it? Because if you're not number one, than someone else did. And if, and if someone else already created it and you want to be number one, you can't. They already created the industry and they're going to be number one. It's, it's very simple. There, uh, there, there's only two ways about it. And if, you're, and if your solution is to be number three, four, five, six, seven, uh, it's, it's not very venture backable. Uh, it, it, it generally goes 60% of the market, 30% of the market, 9% of the market, less than 1% of the market, less than 0.1% of the market, not even worth it. Just really, really disappointed with the growth curve on number six. It's, and occasionally there are 
Seven players selling toilet paper. That, that happens. Not all of them are making money. Not all of them are doing it at scale. And, 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 and some of them are just doing it poorly. Um, so uh, the other thing I like to look at is do you upcycle or do you specialize? Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with upcycling. It's where you take garbage and you turn it into something that isn't garbage. Uh, it's where like if you ever built a table out of driftwood or um, out of... Uh, one, of the, one of my personal favorite ways is, is to take something that's working somewhere in a company and bring it somewhere else. If you've done a really good job at building product, why? And, and, and if you're having trouble marketing that product, what, it, what does product know that you don't know? If sales is really good at selling something, but the product team is really good at, really bad at reacting, what is sales doing that you're not doing, right? Who has the source of knowledge about the user, about the industry? And, how do, and, and, and are you going to say either everything is going to run through them, which is possible and still scalable, or how do, what are they doing to make it work and how do we bring it everywhere? Who understands the user best? Who understands the industry best? Who understands the message best? And how do we make it either ubiquitous or how do we create an operational structure around getting that information from them and giving them more power? Um, the, and, and this comes back to these last two questions. So how do you replicate success across teams? Uh, Algolio did three things very well. Um, first, they built a really good technology. And then they figured out how to build a really good product. Um, if you don't know the uh, oft-repeated story, uh, Algolia tried to build a on-device search engine for mobile. And then someone said, can you put that in the cloud so we can put it on our desktop site as well? And they said, sure, I guess. And, and now Algolia is 300 people across five continents or whatever. Um, uh, and so, uh, and the third thing they did is they figured out how to sell it, right? Uh, and, and, and what you want to do is replicate success, right? The, the technology team, uh, uh, the R&D team built great technology. They, they fed that to the product team, which built a great product. They fed that to the sales team, which sold a great product. They fed that to the marketing team, which said, how, what kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations do you have, and how can we have one-to-many conversations that look just like that? If you've had the same conversation one-on-one -on -one 30 times, that's the same as having a one-to-30 conversation one time, right? And so, how do you repeat that success across teams? And then, and then of course, who's leading and who is following? Is, is the team you're building leading? Are they defining what every other team is going to do? Is the product team, are you a product first company? Are you a sales first company? Are you a marketing first company? This is going to define how your brand gets developed. This is going to define how you scale. If your sales team is better at selling than your product team is building, then your product team needs to be building whatever the sales team is asking for, or you need to get a lot better at building products. It's one of the two. Um, okay, I'm gonna take a quick pause. Is there any, are there any questions? I'm saying a lot of things really, really fast. I personally didn't quite understand your point with the upcycle versus specialization. Yeah. So, um, I, I've generally found, I'm gonna have a beer, is that what, yeah, is okay? Okay. Uh, I've generally found that um, the, the way companies tend to organize, especially when it comes to marketing and, and bringing your brand to the people, is either one person understands the brand and it's all about how do you support that person. The design team is really good, so whatever they build, we're going to build content around it and we're going to run a campaign around it or we're going to set up whatever. Or you diffuse it across the entire company and everyone becomes good. But you have to invest in building that process to make sure everyone always has an equal knowledge of how to do that. Right? Uh, one really good example is to look at Apple. There's a very centralized knowledge source around a very few people inside of Apple. Uh, and, and the rest of the company is about how do we scale that. And it scales. It scales to the, one of the biggest companies on the planet. Uh, but you take someone with an amazing product and an amazing ability to see the future and, 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 and bring it and, and therefore embody the brand. And, you, and everything else is... I mean, they built an entire retail industry that's one of the best retail selling retail chains in the world just so that they had just because they decided that was the most on brand way to distribute telephones and, and MP3 players. Uh, and so you, you either do one or the other and knowing it is going to determine how you scale up and how you, and, and, and how you uh, uh, create that consistency because both of those can result in consistency. One of them is everyone is an equally enabled advocate and we want to support everyone. Uh, and the other is we have some very smart people and we need to support the way that they do things, right? 
Does that make sense? Yeah, I thought that was a good explanation. Good, good. Anything else? Okay. Um, I'll take more questions in a bit. We'll, we'll jump into easy versus hard. Um, does anyone juggle? Any jugglers? Any Rubik's Cube solvers? No? Okay. Then you probably can't do that. That was pretty cool. Um, okay, so let's talk about easy stuff versus hard stuff when it comes to branding. And, and, and this, might, um, this, might, this might answer a little bit of the question. It's really easy to do PR campaigns. Um, I mean, I don't know if there are any communications people in here. I, I've done fundraising news. It's kind of easy. Um, people want to write about numbers. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, doing billboards is pretty easy. It's, it's like drawing a picture and then it's on a wall. Um, it's, it's not that hard. Uh, speaking to early adopters, it's easy. Go do it. Like, um, it doesn't mean it's not valuable, it's, but it's easy to do. Um, and calling out what's off-brand is easy. Saying, this, this doesn't look right. We shouldn't be saying that is really easy to do. Um, what's a little harder is measuring ROI on those campaigns. It is running high-level brand awareness and saying, brand is important, so we're going to invest in PR and billboards. We want to be one of those Silicon Valley companies that you see when you're on the 101. We want to be Zoom or Blue Jeans or, or Ease or whatever, whatever they are. Um, the, the harder part is building the necessary infrastructure to be able to support measuring that. How do you, how do you measure the value of running a billboard campaign in Oklahoma? Because Slack did. And, and, and when you realize that brand isn't just about having a nice pound symbol as, and having a nice logo, but it's actually about building the underlying infrastructure to intelligently measure the expansion of your brand, that's the harder part, right? Because in order to measure the impact of a billboard, you have to have uh, the ability to measure uh, incremental lift regionally. You have to be able to say, how quick is our user adoption growing in San Francisco versus Seattle? Then you have to determine that those two places are demographically similar enough that if you run a campaign in one of those cities and not in the other, you should be able to predict the change in lift. Right? You see where I'm getting. Uh, and that means that everything after what I'm talking about is optimized as a funnel experience. And all of that has nothing to do with running a billboard and, and drawing a picture. Um, right? Even, even better, running on-brand drip campaigns. How do you make sure that your sales outbound messages are on brand? How do you tell a salesperson, hey, I know you have a quota to meet, but it's not really cool when you write this in your outbound messaging. And then he says, it converts. There you go. You try having that conversation tomorrow. Um, seeing when you've hit a ceiling. Seeing when you're no longer an early adopter company. What does it look like when you start to pan out and you start to flatline? How do you identify it? Are you, it's easy to see when you have no growth. But, but do you notice when it's starting to pan, when you notice it's getting a little harder to hit that quarterly metric, to hit that weekly user growth? And, and how and when do you pivot to having a mass audience? And, and, and how do you stay on brand as you do it? Watch Intercom over the next week. Watch what they're going to announce on Thursday? Next Thursday? I don't know. This week or next week? Uh, Intercom is pivoting from an early adopter startup friendly company. So Stripe has been doing this over the past 18 months to uh, uh, one of the, you know, two of the biggest companies in c commercial transactions, to two of the biggest companies in growth and development. And, and watch how they manage to keep, maybe they keep the same logo, but their messaging changes. Or maybe they keep the same messaging, but their logo gets a little, a little less shiny or a little less flat and a little more corporate. And, you, and you'll notice that they, they make these incremental developments they don't move too quickly because that would be inconsistent, but they start to change and they start to see we need to get here and we're here. And they build out a plan step by step of how they're going to get there. And that plan involves feature launches, that involves design changes, that involves changing the way you sell the product, even if it means it's harder to hit your numbers. It's everything because everyone has to have the same experience. Uh, and the last thing um, that I find to be incredibly hard is going slow. Um, the, the thing about brand and, and top of funnel is it's infinite. You can talk to anyone. Everything is something. Everything is awareness. Look, it's 44 people that know what Mad Kudu is that might not have known. Yeah, putting that in my, my stand-up tomorrow. Um, but how do you make sure that you do it right? How do you make sure that what you're, the, the direction you're moving is the right one? 
uh, that there isn't anything in front of you that's going to slow you down because you want to move steadily but swiftly forward and consistently. Um, and, and, and I find that people get really excited about building community, uh, making noise, creating fans, but they, but they stop, they, they, they sometimes overlook the cogs that are turning under them and, and realizing that they're just as much responsible for making sure those cogs turn as they are for putting the billboard up in Seattle. Um, so let's talk about scaling brand. Um, I'm going to do three slides that look a lot like this. They're really ugly, but that's because I wanted it to be valuable. Um, so when we talk about brand, um, so I've, I've, I've been a founder. Um, I'm, I'm not a great founder, but I, I'm an okay founder, but I've been a founder. Uh, I've worked at a company that was one to 10 employees. Um, uh, I've worked at a company that was 10 to 50. I've worked at a company that was 50 to 20. I left a company at 20 to 100, but I wrote about them a lot. And I don't understand how these companies operate and exist on a daily basis. Um, but we'll talk about them anyway. Um, you'll get very little value from me on the 1,000 plus today. But if you get there and you're lost, you got there. So congratulations. Um, I don't know, hire, some, hire someone and, and quit. Um, so uh, let, let's talk about um, the beginning. The, 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 the original conception of a brand is creating value. It is doing something that people fundamentally go, thanks. It's a high five. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great moment. It, it's a hack. It's, it's not even a product. It, it's, it's carrying a woman's groceries upstairs. Uh, or, or, and that equivalent as a SaaS product. I mean, SaaS products have been started as like, you know what's annoying when your Stripe doesn't talk to your Zendesk? That's a business. I guarantee you that's a business. And, and, and that's where you start. You, you, you look at something and you go, that's really stupid that that doesn't do that. Someone should do that. And then you do it and you create value. And, and that's, that is your brand immediately, is the exact thing that you did to solve the thing that bugged you. And what's great about that is you really, as a founder, follow your instinct. You, you don't really lay out a business plan and go, and go I want to get there. You just go, this is wrong, and, and it looks possible to make it right, and you make it right. And then you make it right, and that's good. And all of a sudden, people go, hey, thanks. And you go, how can I make money off of this, thanks? And how can I raise money from Alvin Capital off of, hey, thanks? Um, and, and that's where you start to hire people. And, and that's where the implicit intuition that drove you to go, I think we need to look there because all of the things that I see say we need to look there. Now all of a sudden you have to explain what that intuition was and you have to get to a point where someone else can. And that's generally where you see people start to create a language. Candor, grit, care, trust, humility. And I said it in the wrong order and it feels wrong when I say it. But those five words are ingrained in my head because they were everywhere in Algolia. They are on Slack, they are on the walls, they are in the weekly meetings, they are everywhere. Right? You create a language, you own it, you, you explain it, and you teach it. Right? Uh, uh, sorry, I was, I was thinking about Honey Badger, which is a very weird thing that I've been ad adopting inside of Mad Kudu recently. And, and you, you start to realize it's like the inside joke of, of being in a company. That's, that's the second stage uh, of your company. Is, Everyone internally feels like they understand something that people outside don't, and that's okay. What you really want to do is create this, you want to create a community. That's where you're starting to, to, to create the initial, the initial bubbling up of a company culture is around this idea of like, oh my God, like we know a secret and no one else knows it, and isn't it amazing? And like, no, you had to be there, but it was really good, right? And, and, that's, and, and that's how you're going to get up to those first employees. You're going to build this moment. And then you're going to start communicating it, right? You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to see your first employees communicate it. And they're going to do it wrong, and you're going to learn. And they're going to do it right, and you're going to go, yay! And you're going to have these moments where suddenly the non-founders are as good of brand ambassadors as the founders. You're, you've rendered the founders unnecessary in the equation of communicating your brand to someone else, right? And now you need to go to the next step. Now you need to let other people teach it. Now you have employees onboarding new employees, teaching them what honey badger means, right? Now you, and, and, what that, and at the same time, the same way that's going internally, externally, now you have customers explaining to non-customers who you are. Now you have people referring your product. 
Now you have people, now you have non-customers explaining to other non-customers, I think you should try Algolia because I, I have a vague idea of what they do and I understand what you're saying and they just sound like, you, I think you should try Algolia. And, and that's where your brand starts to become something. It's not a proactive word of mouth. It's the natural evolution of, of you having built and sown the seed and created the ability for people to communicate it. You've created an experience for customers that went from thanks to honey badger thanks. And now they're turning around and they're saying honey badger to other people. And they don't know why they're saying it. And the other people definitely don't know. But all of a sudden there's curiosity, right? And you start to build this brand. And, and then it becomes well known. Uh, there, there, are, there are things we know about uh, well-known brands as they've grown. Uh, Slack's culture, the language that they use, uh, Google's culture, the language that they use, Apple's culture. And, and, and as you start to ramp up, a around 50 is generally where you start to get, like, you start to sound like an old man reliving the good old days. Like the founders start writing, like, when, they were, when we were just in a, in a house in Mountain View, we used to... We used to write post-its on the wall, right? You have this, this old, old feeling. And you start to tell that story as if, as if it's set in stone. Because it is. You've created a language. People speak it. It's starting to get more well-known. And then your goal becomes to explain the merits of the language you chose to create. You have created a brand. And you, you're not evangelizing the brand. It's already a fact that the brand exists. You want to evangelize the reason that that brand was the right brand. You're going next level. You're not even talking about your brand anymore. You're talking about talking about your brand, right? And, and, and as you grow up, right, like, why did I take Latin in sixth grade when I was 10? Was it to meet all the Latina girls in California? I hope not. Otherwise, I had sorely misunderstood what Latina meant at the time. Uh, it was because I understood the value, or let's be honest, my parents, understood the value of learning that language despite the fact that neither of my parents understand Latin whatsoever. And it's the same reason that when I got my driver's license, I learned on a manual car in America. Even because I understood the value of knowing that language. Even though neither of my parents can drive a stick shift, no one else in my family can, I learned because I knew the value of it, right? The, 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 the ubiquity of the knowledge that even something you don't understand is valuable, even though no one around you understands it, and that you might be the only one going into it, that's where you start to see Marketo experts that are triple platinum certified, and you know they're triple platinum certified because it's their tagline on LinkedIn. And it's got like the diamonds, and they're like, I wouldn't lie, the diamonds are legit, like I earned all three of them. And that's where you start to get to a level where you evangelize People are evangelizing you by showing how proficient they are in the language you've created. And again, when we talk about language, it's company culture, it's your product, it's, it's working at the company. People become ex-Googlers and it has its own impronounceable spelling that starts with an X for some reason. And, and it becomes something to be proud of, right? And, and this, is, this is a phase that is very fun, yeah. I have a question, as you grow, as your company has grows, how do you keep track? How do you keep track of the progress that you bring? It's going to happen no matter what. Oh, that's the worst part. Because if you're not, if you're not proactively controlling it, your ex employees are going to say stuff about you. How and do you by control it? you have a, it's not like you have a dashboard with numbers. You, you start by carrying the old lady's groceries up the stairs. You can yes. So to answer your question, uh, one thing we did at Algolia is we measure. Uh, on a weekly or monthly basis, or they do, they may do, and we did, uh, uh, the number of, uh, the relationship of how many times people use different Slack emojis per week relating to our five values. Because it happened across hundreds of channels, they saw something that showed care, they would drop care on there and people would upvote it, right? And so we, we tried to look at how much internally are we doing it? Are we staying consistent? Is it, is it falling below? Uh, Algolia is a transparent company, so we looked at what percentage of conversations on Slack were happening in public versus private channels to make sure that we weren't losing track of that. Because as long as it's working internally, it'll work externally. Another thing you can do is you can run what's called a brand awareness survey. A brand awareness survey is something you run at a regular interval where you do two things. You do what's called, oh I'm terrible with the language, uh, you do what's called 
uh, uh, unassisted and assisted uh, uh, brand awareness. So one is I go to you and I go, when you think of building search into your website, what do you think of? And you answer. And I go, if you were going to build search into your website today, what, what, what do you think you would choose? What, what providers do you think you would think of? And then I go, have you ever heard of Algolia? And then I go, if you were going to build search, which of the following would you choose? Where Algolia is one of the list, right? And, and this is how you, you operate. And you actually build a survey of how many people think of you when, when, when they're prompted about your category but not given your name. How many people say that they've heard of you? And then how many people, once they know that you are the one asking, because who asks about another company other than themselves, how many people would say that they would consider using you? Now, is that a direct reflection of, of how many people know you and how many people would consider using you? Yes and no. What's interesting is the evolution over time. And then you come back to things like do, running that city by city across thousands of people and looking at if you were going to build it, if you were going to try to improve teamwork in your company, what solution would you look at? When you think about doing a collaborative chat platform, what platform do you think of buying? Have you heard of Slack? And I'm going to do that in Oklahoma and I'm not going to do it in St. Louis. And then I'm going to do it again in three months after I run my billboard campaign and I'm going to, and I'm going to see how the lift changes. Right? And that's how you can actually measure externally the adoption. It's expensive. Uh, we ran a couple quarterly brand awareness surveys uh, and we found two things. One, really hard to pull developers. They don't like being pulled and, and most of the platforms that offer to introduce you to sur survey participants are bad at finding developers. Uh, and number two, it, it was expensive. It was, I mean, it's, I think it's like $8 per answer. Maybe sometimes, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on how specific you are. If you want humans, it can be a dollar. If you want your actual target audience in a SaaS company, it's probably $10 or more per answer. So then are you willing to pay $3,000 a quarter just to know if people have heard of you? In the case of Algolia, it's something that is expensive. Early on, you're in the, in the left of the company. Is this something that you still invest in? Or do you wait until maybe around 1,500 employees to track it? It's equally as hard uh, and proportionally as expensive no matter when you start. So starting later doesn't save you money. Uh, because the ramp up and you end up doing the exact same thing. Uh, in the case of Algolia, it's complicated. Sometimes we did it, sometimes we didn't do it, sometimes we didn't do it for the right reasons, sometimes we did it for the wrong reasons. And as it turns out, companies are uh, fallible. Um, so um, this is purposefully very vague, so let's talk about something more specific like content. Um, I'm a writer, I used to write a blog, I'm sure a lot of you have written things before. Um, so let's, let's come back to the same thing. You're, you're a startup, you, you want to write because all of your favorite people have Medium accounts and it's got all the claps and you want all the claps because there's got to be some ratio that converts claps to customers, so get the claps. Um, so how do you start? You start by writing what you know. You don't think out an editorial line, you don't think out a strategy, you just write what makes sense. If you think you learned something and it made you go, oh wow, thanks, write about it. If you think you know something, write about it. If you think you have a problem and you don't have the solution and it's really bugging you, write about it. Write about anything. I cannot be more clear than that. Just write. Uh, and, and there's no company for whom that is a bad idea. Right? Uh, and, and what you're going to notice is some of your content sucks. Maybe you're a bad writer. As it turns out, writing isn't a, a, a natural born skill, it's a muscle. And the more you write, the better you get. Hence, write anything. Just start writing. No one's going to read the fifth article you ever wrote, ever, no matter what. I haven't even read the fifth article posted on the Mad Kudu blog, and, and the Mad Kudu blog is where I live. So uh, uh, don't worry about it. Write, get stuff out there. And the first time you write something that's good, you'll know. It'll, be, it'll make you go, oh, wow, that was worth it. Uh, the other ones weren't worth it, but that one was worth it. And learn from it, right? And, and you, you'll find a voice. You'll find that people think you're interesting when you talk about X. They don't care when you talk about Y. Um, a really good example is uh, Mathilde from Front, uh, an, an e-founders company, who has found a very good voice in being transparent. She raises money, she shares a deck. She works on a product, she shares the reasoning why. She's, that voice works well. Is, is Front uh, a company that is standing its ground on top of transparency? In some ways, yes. In some ways, they're, they're standing their ground on collaboration, on helping each other. And what Front does is she helps the community. 
uh, what Mathilde does is she helps the community, and what Front does is they help people get stuff done. And so what you do is what naturally works, that first spark, is what's going to take you to something a little more concrete, right? And, and as you grow, the first time you have someone write something that isn't you writing it, you're going to have to define your voice. You might do it implicitly by saying like, hey, I'll look at it, I don't like any of this, start over, or I'll give you a bunch of edits and I'm going to turn your entire Google Doc red with suggestions. Um, but if you're proactive about it, you might sit down and say, what is our voice? Who do we want to be? Who are we talking to? What do people think of us when we talk? Why do we speak? And you might start to build a personality around your voice, a, a written brand, right? Uh, and, and, and as you grow, you're going to want to spread that voice across other places. If you've, if you've defined a voice and you know how to let someone who's not a founder write a blog post, you know how to write to do video, you know how to do a podcast, you know how to go to events, you know how to speak on stage. And the reason is, it's the same voice in different medium across. And so as you grow, you invariably end up expanding. One, because it's operationally efficient. If I do a webinar, I should probably write an article about it because I already did all the legwork to create value in the webinar, so why would I not write an article about it? If I've done a webinar, why would I not turn it into a talk? I've already done all the legwork to write slides and present it spoken for 30 minutes. That probably fits in pretty well at a meetup, right? You start to see that there's an operational efficiency. You do, a, you do a podcast based on a webinar where you interview the same person who was on the webinar and you publish the blog post afterwards. Why do we do stuff that's operationally efficient and therefore redundant content? Because I don't follow your podcast, I follow you on Twitter, and I only get your blog posts, right? I'm going to meet you for the first time in an event, and, it, and if you have to do the legwork every single time to do something unique at every single medium that you engage with, you're just not going to engage enough. You're not going to have as many conversations. You're going you're gonna to grow less, you're going to see less people. And then as you get bigger, you, you really want to get to a point where Anyone who speaks any language should be able to speak like you do. For example, uh, I should be able to write a blog post on Slack's multiple people are writing or typing blog. And, the, and, and in reality, I could because their content guidelines and their design guidelines and their tone of voice guidelines are, are explicitly written because they've onboarded 50 employees to do it over the past three years. So they could probably get me on board pretty quickly, right? Uh, I got invited to write a guest post for another SaaS company. They have an entire, here are three articles we think best represent our voice. Here are some of the things you might have noticed in them. If you want to write, this is how we suggest you start. This is where we can help you. You have an entire process that allows anyone to go from, I've never written before, to writing authentically in, in, a, in, a, in a brief amount of time. Um, and again, the last stage is always maintain dominance, mitigate downside, take calculated risks. Um, that, one, that one doesn't change. Um, don't, don't tweet after you IPO and, and, don't, and, and, and make calculated bets. Um, uh, scaling product. Okay, so one last one, and then I think we're wrapping up. Because I think this has gone on long enough. Um, so um, when you start building, I'm going to preface this by saying I don't build products. I'm terrible at building products. I can't, I, my slides are ugly. I'm terrible at UX. I'm not going to tell you how to be a good product builder. What I'm going to talk to you about is scaling product. And let me, let me uh, dive in a little bit. So the first thing, we talked about it. Build what you know. Follow your intuition. Experiment. Pivot. Find, follow your instinct. Like, really follow your nose. If you, if you feel something, go after it. And you get to something. And you're going to know exactly when you get to it because it's going to feel like you got there. You're going to see it. You're going to see that people go, thanks. And that's, that's when you've built something, right? And then the, the next step right after that is, is to create an emotional attachment to that thanks. People aren't saying thanks to startupapp.com. They're saying thanks to Paul, right? They're saying thanks to Hannah. They're saying thanks to, to a human behind the brand. And you start to build emotion into it. You add a new note into your note-taking app. And, and it says, way to go, right? You start to build language into your product. You start to build a connection with the user. The user feels good when they do it. They feel bad when they wait too long to do it, right? You start to create this relationship. They look forward to opening it. You're the, you're the most important thing they're going to look at for five minutes today, right? 
and and as you get there you, you uh you're going to start creating an emotional bond people are going to start advocating for you because they're going to say there is no product that i get more value out of in what i do every single day than this one i only look at it seven seven minutes a day i'm sure the reality is they look at it for 50 minutes a day they just don't see the time pass right you create this relationship but they love it uh, we just had uh, a really interesting end of our quarter uh, because we had maybe three new accounts come in where they sent us an email on tuesday and the email said send us a contract we're ready and then we signed them and they're good to go and that was it. And we're not a self-serve product, and we're not a cheap product either. Um, and, and the reason is because all three of those people were three people who had worked at companies that were customers before. They had left those companies, or even in one case, they worked at a company that wanted to use us and didn't end up using us. And the second they joined a new company, they sent us an email. For one person, it was day two on the new job. Uh, and, and that is an emotional relationship. They said, I'm new in my job. I got to prove that I know what I'm doing. I probably negotiated a really nice salary. How am I going to do it? Mad coup. Boom. Easy win. I give them money. They give me the ability to look cool in front of my new boss. It's true. We do that. Um, it's kind of nice. It's a good feeling. Um, and, and, and that's, that's the, the, the impact that you start to build. You start, you start to get to a point where people are like, oh, I got to have them. Like, wait, are you doing that and you're not using them? How do you even like, how do you even do if you're not using them, right? People start to become arrogant about using your product. They're like, wait, you're, you're not? I don't even understand. I don't even understand. What is it, 2012 or whatever five years from right now is? And so the, the, the goal, again, is as, as we looked at the brand, it was create something authentic that comes from within, right? It was manage to communicate it to someone that isn't you. Make it explicit. Manage to communicate it to someone who hasn't had that experience, right? It's really easy to have a customer have a great experience. How do you make a non-customer know how great that experience is? And then how do you get to a point where a non-customer can explain to someone else how great that experience is? That's what we're building. That's what we're trying to get to. Uh, and, and that's what we do when we scale a product. Again, the end stage is always the same. And as it turns out in this one, at around 200 employees, I find that the general answer is just don't, don't fuck it up. Just, just keep doing If you got to 200 people with a product, just keep it going. You've built all of the things you need to make sure that your voice stays the same. I don't know. Don't, just don't make a radical change. Don't change your pricing or don't make an open source API suddenly close or don't screw over developers is probably a good rule in everything that you do. Um, anyway, um, so um, to, to sort of wrap it up, um, emotions are really complicated. Um, I, I love creating uh, a, an emotional connection between a human and a thing that isn't human. It's, uh, what were we saying today? It's, it's, survival, it's survival instinct. It's, it's, it's actually for your benefit that you create an emotional connection because you think that you have a better chance of staying alive if you have an emotional attachment to it, right? That's, that's what your brain is doing. And that's really cool, right? Why do we build emotional attachment bet between people? Because we think we'll survive longer if those people are emotionally invested in us. And, and, and we'll survive longer if we're emotionally invested in them because of that, right? And, and you're actually tricking the brain when you build a brand. You're tricking the brain and manipulating it to do exactly what it wants to do. But you're, but you're, the, but you're the one driving it, right? Uh, and and here, here are three good lessons, right? Yeah. If you're comfortable, you're probably not doing enough. Um, that is... If, if you feel like you're happy with how things are going, you probably need to step it up a little bit. Um, if you're bouncing around a lot, I've, I've been in this situation, you run a campaign. Okay, it went well. You run another campaign. Okay, it went well. I don't really know what the connection was between those two campaigns, but you know, we had different priorities this quarter. Next quarter, oh man, we really got to focus on this. Okay, we're going to jump over here. If you're jumping around a lot, especially on top of funnel, brand, and that goes for design, if you're constantly doing new mock-ups, doing new whatever, uh, doing new typographies, whatever, whatever you might do. If you're building random new sets of features, if you're, if you're running random campaigns, sometimes you're doing ABM, sometimes you're running a PR campaign, sometimes whatever, it, it means your foundation probably isn't solid. It means that one of those early steps, create something real, communicate it to everyone else, communicate it outward, you, you probably need to go back and revisit those, those base steps because you're probably trying to jump a step and, and you might have jumped a little too far, right? Um, 
if, if you can't get other teams to be on brand, remember that your team is your brand. It's not about getting people on brand. It's not about how do we make sure the sales team doesn't mess it up. It's about how do we create a company where the sales team knows exactly why it's important. Well, we don't, we don't have to review their copy. No one wants to review a salesperson's copy. It's the most boring thing on the entire planet. What you want is, is to feel like everyone is mutually invested in taking this amazing thing that we discovered and fostered internally and bringing it to everyone else. Um, there, there are a few things that I referenced um, that you're, you're welcome to take a look at. I don't put anything for persona development. Just talk to your users, talk to non-users, talk to people, have phone calls, ask people if you can buy them coffee, whatever. Um, I like playing around with brand archetypes. I'm not a professional uh, in, in, in that space, but it's really interesting. Um, it's going to have you talk about whether you're a rebel brand, whether you're an everyman brand, things like that. Um, this is the first thing I do when I walk into any new company is a brand strategy canvas. Um, there's also a slide share presentation of the same name that goes with it that actually runs through uh, building a brand strategy canvas for Zappos, um, which at one point was a relevant shoe company um, and is now uh, still a relevant shoe company, I guess. Um, and then the last thing, uh, I'm not a marketer. I am exactly what I told you I was before. I'm a mathematician who studied the classics. Um, and as soon as I realized that I needed to take my intuition and turn it explicit, this is the book I read right here. Um, this one's great. It's from like 1992, I think, or 91. Uh, Donald Trump's in it. Not his voice, but uh, they talk about his brand, which I think is just so great right now. Um, they talk about IBM versus Apple, which is amazing, right? I mean, there's just so many things that are patently wrong. Like the, the, the author makes very bold predictions about the future of brands, and he's wrong more often than not, but it doesn't change the value of the book. It's still very, very valuable. And that's where you get things like, do you want to be number one or number two? Um, these really easy things that help you shape and think about what kind of brand you're building. Um, and, and they're pretty amazing. Um, and I think that that is going to be it. Did you share the slides afterwards? Or? Always. I'll, I'll um, something them to you. <coughs> They'll be on the interwebs or on Mad Kudu's website. Yeah. Yeah, got to get that email, you know? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you guys very much. I hope that was uh, what you were hoping to get out of this. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, you're saying when you have like a multiple persona, I've got I've got a core user like a developer, but at the end of the day, I know that uh, the the CIO has to buy off, and they're never going to touch the product. Yeah. Um, oh man. Uh, coming from the developer industry, I, I say you always want to treat your heroes well. Uh, you want to build a product that makes it really easy for your heroes to pitch it. So in that case, I'd say build a product that your developers are going to love that they can pitch to the CIO. Uh, and 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 there there's. There's a lot of really interesting stuff um, that's, coming, that, that's coming down in terms of how you, I instead, especially around multi-user uh, account journeys, um, where, and, and this is something where I'm, I'm not an expert, but my, one of our co-founders is, and he's amazing at that, uh, and, and there's a talk online that I'll, that I'll share later. Um, it's not about one individual's journey and driving them, so you don't want to design it for the buyer, right? Um, you want to design it for the account. At the end of the day, you're not selling to a user, you're selling to an account. Everything in B2B SaaS is about selling to an account. And that account can be as complex as it wants, but at the end of the day, you need to know when an account is ready to buy and what it takes to get them to be ready to buy. And then you need to know who you need to talk to, who needs to be in the room, and how to get it there. Now, it may be that your CIO needs to be able to use the product in order to buy it, or whoever your buyer happens to be. It may be that they just need to be invited into the first meeting because you know it's going to be four and a half months from the first meeting you have with that person, so you want to get them in the door as quickly as possible, right? And, and that uh, is a solvable equation and, and not necessarily related to how you build out personas and, and how you build out uh, your brand. At the end of the day, your brand should be able to accommodate any potential user, right? It should be able to be, it should be relevant to anyone, user, non-user, employee, partner, janitor, right? And so what you want to build at the end of the day, if you're building a hero brand, you probably want to build something that makes your heroes feel like heroes. 
even though your heroes aren't the ones with the wallet. Uh, and, and I personally favor building a, a hero brand. I want, I want people, I want unsung heroes to feel like the superheroes that they are. I want to be the phone booth where they, they go in and they come out and they're Superman, you know? Um, uh, and I would be hard pressed to find an example where you can't do that, but I won't tell you you can't because you might have to. So, so yeah, but, it, but one thing to think about is when does that buyer need to be in the journey? And are you bringing them in too early because you think it'll make it go faster? Or are you bringing them earlier because you think it'll make the deal go faster? Are you bringing them in because you found that if you don't, they don't get it because they go on the website and they're confused? Uh, and they go, why are we paying $1,000 a month for this thing? I don't get it. Try to find what's stopping, wh why are you changing away from your core user to worrying about the buyer? And look at maybe, maybe the variable isn't about what our brand is, but it's about how we're introducing our brand to that person. And when. I, I really like personally when the user ends up pitching the, the buyer for you. That's, that's always a nice outcome. Um, and then it comes back to just making that person super fucking happy. Yeah. From the experience, what do you think about branding founders versus branding investors? Um, they're invariably locked. Um, uh, I find that, well, let's go back like, which way's up? That's up. Let's go back to this. Let's go to that one. I find that around here, you start to think about the companies, the, the, like, the brand of the company, and you actually start to build out the brand of the founders. Uh, maybe like here, like at this point at 50 employees. I think around 50 employees we realized um, the CEO of Algolia probably wasn't going to be the guy who was going to pitch exponential growth um, because he didn't want to. And turns out you can't make a CEO do what they don't want to. Um, uh, but, and among other things, it wasn't what he wanted to talk about. And, and we started to see but up until then, he was pitching worldwide search, always on, it's amazing, milliseconds matter, because his job as a CEO was to do that. And as his job shifted away from being support growth to support business growth to support overall company growth, he was actually able to open up his voice. And, and what I really like is if you can look at an executive team and you can say, what's our VP engineering's voice? Well, his job most likely should be bringing in more engineers. It's also good if he's good to push the, the, the technical side. And uh, In API companies, you typically have a VP engineering and a CTO, but that, that might be the same person, so they might have a dual faceted approach. But I like the VP engineering to be the person who is the best employer brand. Uh, if you look at Algolia, the VP engineering is a, is a monster. He's a beast. Uh, and, and he's the reason a lot of people go to work for that company initially, and he's the reason a lot of people are still there. Uh, and then you look at the VP sales and he takes and he embodies the, the business growth. And you look at the CTO and he embodies the, the technical vision, right? Everyone actually has their own individual brand. The VP engineering doesn't really pitch the sales growth. He'll come in and say, we power a billion searches a day. And, and let me talk to you about why that's technically relevant for what we're doing. <laughs> because that means that we have these problems that you only have when you have this many API calls every second. Um, and, and so... It, 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 it almost naturally develops. Um, it may happen before 50 employees. That's when I arrived at Algolia, so that's when I started thinking about it. Maybe it happens in the 10 to 50 space, but early on, it's the same thing. Um, I mean, let's look at Front to come back to Mathilde. Uh, those brands are different today. Front has its own brand, Mathilde has her own brand. Um, she's obviously her brand supports the growth of her company. They're, they're not meant to be divergent, but they're distinct, right? You start to see that they, they split out a little bit and you see that one is, has some elements. The same with the founders of Airbnb. And, and I would imagine, yeah, 10, 10 to 50 employees, maybe even one to 10. Uh, maybe even one to 10, you start to, you start to notice it. Um, I, I'd say at Mad Kudu, we already have, I already have a, 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 a thumb impression that one of the founders and one of the execs is going to carry one voice more than the other, and it kind of naturally plays itself well, right? The same thing that brought those three distinct voices together to, to make one brand, it, you're actually going to see that one of those people brought the majority of one of those things, and, and, and they kind of separate out again. Um, and, and, then, and then at the end of the day, companies are multifaceted, and, and you're only an employee of a company, even when you're the founder. Uh, and so at the end of the day, you have your voice outside of the company and inside. It's really convenient if what you say outside doesn't completely tarnish what you say inside. 
Um, but you can be your own human. You can be a uh, uh, founders make political donations that don't that, and, and brands on companies generally don't make political statements um, it, unless you're Apple and you can change an economy by stopping to sell a product there. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that helps. All right. uh, any other questions? Would everybody like to have a drink and then just come up and ask me in a more personal setting? Good. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. This was really fun. I hope you had a good time. Thank you.